Thank you for coming to the Prime Minister's constituency to let everyone know how angry you are about this crazy, cruel badger pal. We are going to go this way to the Green. And the Green is where we're going to gather and I'm going to be able to speak to you. Stop the car! Thank you for coming. I want to start by saying thank you to Emily. She's here somewhere. If you want to put your hand up a moment, there she is. Who's done amazing work just bringing this together. Like this. this is one now of seven, eight town hall city events we've been having around the country from Kettering, from Northampton, Bedford, Taunton, Manchester. We've got them planned in Brighton. We've got them planned in Derbyshire. Each of these events is bringing people together in a way that I've never seen before in a wildlife campaign like this. And I think it's because of the anger that this policy is causing. Yeah. This yeah. has no sense. It doesn't make any sense on a scientific basis. It makes no sense on an economic basis. And it makes no sense in terms of animal welfare and wildlife protection at all. I've worked in and out of government and industry and farming for 30 years. I've never seen anything as bad as this. It's such a politically driven policy. It's got more holes than a Swiss cheese. And it's all based upon demonization of the poor badger. Here, here. Okay, yeah. the badger has come out the fall guy for other people's mistakes, their incompetence, their negligence, and their deceit. Let's be clear about that. Yeah. Yeah. Okay? And when people say to you this, when the farmers tell you that they have a problem with bovine TB, of course they have a problem with bovine TB. It costs us a lot of money as taxpayers too, and we should feel sympathy for them in terms of how they deal with this. But let's remember, the badgers got the disease from cattle. Correct. Yeah. And they got that disease because of the intensive nature of our cattle systems today. Right again. The first case of bovine TB or TB in a badger was documented in 1971. There was cases before then, but what we started to see was a rapid rise. And that's not a surprise from the 70s onwards, as we had more intensive livestock systems in this country developed. We move 13 million cattle a year in Britain. That is more than anywhere else in the European Union. 
and we have terrible biosecurity in place. Despite improvements, which I'll talk about in a moment, it's still not good enough. In the last six years, we've moved 78 million cattle in Britain, but we've only ever had 24 investigations for TB fraud. Shame. And only 11 prosecutions in that time. Shame. And there are farmers that can alter the ear tags of cattle, can alter cattle passports, yes. can sell. TB reactor cattle into the food chain when they shouldn't yes. be and melt from TB reactors when they shouldn't be and pass this disease around and they know they're not going to get prosecuted. They know they're not going to get fines or go to prison as a result. And that basically is then ending up with the badger being persecuted and slaughtered for nothing. And that is not acceptable. And then we have the mistakes in the past and God knows we've had some bad mistakes in the past. The TB levels in our herd in this country prior to 2000 were relatively low. A few thousand cases a year, not comparably worse than most of the European Union countries that had TB in their herds. But then we had a massive spike in 2001. Why did that happen? Because we had foot and mouth in this country. And I worked between MAF and the food industry at this time and could see a picture emerge that really should worry all of us. The National Farmers <laughs> Union lobbied very hard, Tony Blair and the Labour government, against a vaccination policy to deal with foot and mouth in the herds of this country. The chief veterinary officer, the chief scientist at the time, the support of the Prince of Wales, the Soil Association and other bodies had decided actually you could vaccinate those cattle. You could have slowed the transmission of that disease without destroying the national herd. But the National Farmers Union decided they didn't want to lose the export market for meat and dairy foods. They went to Tony Blair with the support of the food industry. They lobbied very hard and they turned the policy overnight on its head. And we destroyed the national herd in 2001. Millions of cattle, millions of sheep were destroyed. And then we shut down the countryside for almost six months. We delayed a general election. Yeah. And we spent in total nearly eight billion pounds. Two billion compensating farmers for the lost cattle and a six billion plus because of the impact on the economy. And if that wasn't bad enough, the National Farmers Union then came back and said, we've got to restock cattle. We've got to move cattle back in to the areas of the country where farmers no longer have a viable business. And the chief veterinary officer and the scientists concerned, so we'll hold on a minute. The one area of the country where you've got a low level of TB, where you will be moving those cattle, has a very high level, sorry, a foot to mouth has a very high level of TB. And you're going to have to put in test systems to stop the spread of that disease. But what did the NFU say? They said, don't worry about TB. All we care about is getting the herd back together again, getting those farmers back in business, getting those farmers paying the National Farmers Union dues, of course, as well. So what did we do? We moved hundreds of thousands of cattle with no TB systems in place, no checks, no control mechanisms, no testing at all for two years. And if you look at the figures, you will see that the disease rate for bovine TB in this country trebled between 2001 and into 2003. And it just didn't treble in the cattle, it trebled in the badger community as well because we know it goes both ways between these species. So that incompetence, that negligence, was industrial pollution by the farming industry on wildlife never seen before in post-war Britain. And we basically have created a monster of a disease, and now the National Farmers Union is saying, well, we made a mistake, but oh no, we'll learn from that, but we must eradicate badgers as a consequence. That is not good enough. That will not happen, and that should not happen. And then we come to this cull, the politics behind this cull. This is David Cameron's seat here. And we're here today because we want to make a statement. This is his cull. This is Cameron's cull. Make no, no bones about it. David Cameron in opposition with his then shadow agriculture minister, Jim Pace, a farmer and a minister I knew well in government, cooked up this policy with the National Farmers Union. There were votes in this policy for the Conservative Party in different areas of rural Britain. Farmers voted for them on this. Tory MPs were elected on this policy that are now sitting in the House of Commons supporting the crucifixion slaughter of our badgers as it stands at the moment. Yes, Let's be clear about that. Criminal. It is criminal. And that was politics. That wasn't science-based. Okay? They did nothing illegal. The trade unions and the Labour Party have similar relationships and trade-offs. But that doesn't lead to the destruction of our wildlife in the way that this crazy policy is. The randomised badger call that last Labour government did cost £50 million. It killed 11,000 badgers. Some of the most eminent scientists in the world, like Lord Krebs, who are no lovers of badgers, they're not sentimental about badgers, but what they wanted to do was a decent piece of peer-reviewed research that would really tell us once and for all as to whether killing these animals in this way would slow down the progression of this disease. And what did they find? They said it would make no major contribution at all. And in fact, it could make it worse. 
Yeah. Did the government listen? Did no. the Tories and David Cameron no. listen? I can tell you now, in 2009, when John Krebs and others finished that report, they took it to the shadow agricultural team. They took it to David Cameron and said, listen, if you're going to come into government, you need to read this and need to think about your policy. Don't go down a culling route. It's not the right way to go. What did David Cameron say? Forget it. Throw that out the window. We've made a deal with the NFU and the farmers. We need the votes. We're going to go with a coal policy and forget the science. Shame. That's why John Krebs, that's why John Beddington, that's why Bob Watson, some of the most eminent scientists in this country, are so angry about this policy because of the way it's been politicised. They've been pushed aside. And what we're doing is destroying wildlife for no good reason at all. And then we come to the coal. Why is it that we're subcontracting out the killing to the National Farmers Union? When there's yeah. ever been a cull, any research was undertaken by government officials. Good reason for that, because you're open to public scrutiny, both yes. by Parliament and by the public. Yes. Okay, and that matters. Yes. But when you subcontract out to lampers and pest controllers, yes. and people, to be honest, of dubious kitback down and character, to go around and killing our wildlife at night, intimidating and threatening people who want to peacefully protest against yes. it, yes. it's criminal. It is criminal. And it's wrong. That. These people are incompetent. Anyone who was free shooting badgers should have known from the start. If you speak to decent marksmen, and there are people out there that cull deer and others professionally for a living, and they will tell you this that free shooting of badgers at night was always going to be difficult. You were never going to get the numbers. Badgers aren't daft, they're really sensitive animals. You go anywhere near a set, they're going to disappear quicker than David Cameron or Owen Patterson do when they have a difficult question. <laughs> Down the hole, and they're not going to come up. They're not going to come up. And that's what happened. Ten days into this cull, free shooting was the majority, 90% of the ratio. Civil servants in DEFRA had said to Owen Patterson, hold on a minute, guys, you should have split it 50-50, Minister, because if it doesn't work, free shooting, we're going to have to go to trap and shoot. What did Owen Patterson say? He said, no way, because if you do more than 10% uh, trapping and shooting, it's going to cost more. And then I'm basically going to have to go to MPs and Parliament and the public and tell them why I'm actually spending as much trapping and shooting a badger than I would trapping and vaccinating a badger. Doesn't yeah. want to do that. Exactly. So we go with the cheaper option. You push it to the NFU and let them get on with it. Well, it all went pear-shaped, didn't it? Yeah. Ten days in. Ten days in, you had 90 dead badgers in both zones. Leaking like a sieve, DEFRA. Disillusioned civil servants, mutiny. Panic in the ranks. What does Patterson do? You've got to get the cages out, guys. But we haven't got enough labour. We don't have enough people to lay the cages and actually get the badgers in there. These people have been going in, they've been putting the cages down, they've been shooting these badgers at point-blank range with shotguns, they've not even been cleaning the cages between the kills. It's not being done professionally. The numbers have plummeted. The costs have gone sky high. The policing cost of this cull alone is around £4 million. The civil servant time, I can assure you, is probably over a million pounds. And they talk about the Welsh government wasting money on vaccination when these guys have probably spent the best part of five million quid on a thousand dead badgers. Yeah. You tell me the logic in that. No logic whatsoever. And then you didn't test any of the animals either. You didn't test any of those badgers. And why didn't you test them? Well, we go back to the randomised badger cull. Two important issues. Firstly, the overall disease rate in the badger population from those 11,000 dead badgers. We found around 16.5%. But that disease was at a low level. It wasn't impacting the health of the badger. They would live their lives without showing any major negative health symptoms at all. And the risk of spread was actually quite low. They found 1.5% with the disease at a very progressive stage. That it was basically killing the badger and it was excreting the disease at a high rate. That's 1.5% of those 11,000 badgers. Okay? And that's why these guys are not testing those badgers, because they know they will get yep, the same yep, results yep, again. Yep, yep. Okay? Exactly. And if you're going to spend £5 million pounds on 1,500, 2,000 dead badgers, and then you're going to take it nationally, and you say you're doing that when there's only 1.5% of them actually have this disease, that's yes. not going to wash for anyone. Yeah. And when David Cameron has he's repeatedly said that we're doing badgers a favour by killing them because they're so diseased and ill. Yeah. Yeah. Hold on a minute. Have I just missed something? 99% of those badgers have no major health problems at all, have no disease, or have a very low rate of that disease. You have no right to destroy those animals. No. Yeah. And let's think about it for a moment. Those animals have lived in this country for 300,000 years. There are sets around this area that go 500 years old, that go back to the Elizabethan period. Okay, we're not just talking about animals that have been brought in, like foxes, or we're looking at rabbits and other creatures that were not native to this country. Which, yes, we are talking about an animal that's been here for hundreds of thousands of years that has a protected status. 
And I want to come on to that protected status. I've had one hell of a week this week fighting in the media about the illegal killing of these badgers. I want to say thank you to Sky News who are here today. film with Sky News, okay? We were filming a piece about the end of the coal and the possible extension. It would have been a minor item in the news, maybe three or four items down. It needed to be done. I gave up a day to go and do it. Isabel Webster comes back to me after she finished filming. She says, Dominic, I spoke to some farmers and they've admitted they're gassing badgers. No! Oh, no. Disgusting! And she said, you didn't, didn't know they were saying it when the camera was on and when the mic was on. And I said, I think, Isabel, you've got one of the biggest stories of this cull, okay? You need to go back and do some research. She went back and did it, and good credit to her and the team at Sky. They went back down to the West Country. They interviewed farmers off the record, as they had to because of legal restrictions to take that into account. But they found 14 within a day that admitted that they were gassing badgers. No. Okay? And not only are they gassing badgers, they're organising themselves into groups to gas badgers. Skull. They're sharing best practice to gas badgers. They're basically influencing government policy to gas badgers. No. This is criminal activity. Now then, if you're an ex-colony miner in the north and you're baiting badgers, quite rightly you can go to prison, and many have, and they should. And if you're a farmer and you're in this part of the world and you're killing badgers, you're given a green light from Owen Patterson and from Peter Kendall, the NFU. You're patted on the back. You're told, don't worry, guys, you're actually helping us get closer to a national goal policy. That's absolutely disgusting. And you know, when the question was put to Owen Patterson on Sky News, what's your reaction, Secretary of State, to our investigation of these 14 farmers? You know what he said? He said it's unfortunate. It's unfortunate. He's unfortunate. He didn't say it was illegal. He didn't say it was criminal. He said it was unfortunate. Yeah, it's unfortunate for him that this information had come to everyone's attention because he knows it's going on, and so does Peter Kendall and the NFU as well. We have a serious criminal conspiracy by farmers of this country to wipe out our wildlife that has been given the green light by this government and by the National Farmers Union. Okay? And I don't say that lightly. I don't say that lightly, but it's important. Now, the other thing you must remember is Natural England came back with more revised figures on the badgers. I know people laughed a bit at my quotes in The Guardian and other papers this week saying they've all gone on holiday, and it was a bit of a sarcastic point. But what I was trying to say is, yes, the goalpost bit is funny, okay? No problem. But that's where you expect the media to go. They say, well, politicians manipulate data all the time to get their message out. This case, they haven't manipulated it. I can assure you those figures are accurate. What Natural England has done is shown us that we probably had a 65, 66% drop in 12 months, okay? There is no scientist in this land that will tell you last winter would have resulted in a 66% drop in badgers. A scarcity of food would have resulted in a 66% drop in badgers. Any disease would not have resulted in 66% drop unless it was like what we had with distemper in 1988 in the seals on the East Coast that wiped out 50%. And that was a huge issue. And we're well aware of the issues that are around that. That hasn't happened. We have a pretty healthy badger population, to the point that the whole policy the NFU created was that the numbers were exploding. And if they're exploding, we've got to kill them. But now we're being told they're disappearing at a rate that we can't even keep up. Like Lord Lucan, they're going, we can't find them. All right? But let me tell you something. I know they haven't gone on holiday. I know it's not been disease. I know it's not been bad weather. What worries me is it's been gassing that's killed those badgers. Organised gassing by farmers over the last 12 months. 12 months ago in October, they were worried that we'd won this debate. And they've taken the law into their own hands. They've got themselves organised and they've gone to work with carbon monoxide and they've gassed a large number of sets and they've destroyed a large number of badgers. And Natural England, let me tell you this, are in trouble. Because Natural England, and being the good civil servant I was when I worked in, the, in math as it was, you would have had to do a very concise brief for the Secretary of State before you give him those figures. You would have had to have taken account of every option that could have led to that decline. And in that brief, there'll be quite a big piece on the potential for illegal killing of badgers to knock the numbers down. But did the Secretary of State mention anything on illegal killing of badgers when he went to the House no. of Commons on Wednesday? No. no. Has he done anything to mention the fact other than when he was pressed by Sky and he said it was unfortunate? No. no. Because he doesn't want to admit what's going on. And I'm also very worried that he actually had those figures from Natural England before this cull started. Yes. And then everyone goes, hold on a minute, if he had them, why didn't he use them? Well, he didn't use them because he knows we're going to have the sort of debate we're having now. Hold on a minute, where did all the badgers go? Yep. And then we're going to think, well, maybe they were illegally killed. And then he's going to go, my God, they probably are. And not only that, I know some of the people that are doing it. That's the problem that you now have. A criminal conspiracy of large-scale illegal wildlife crime in this country. The complicity. That is going back to that.
Yeah. It's going back to the National Guard Unit. And it's coming back to David Cameron as well. Because he cannot get away from this issue. Cameron out! This is a scandal. This is worse than selling peerages. This is worse than questions for answers and payments. This is eradication of our wildlife, 300,000 years it's existed, illegally, that's been given the green light from government. I'm not saying that Owen Patterson's doing this. What I am saying is he's not stopping it. He's the Secretary of State for protecting wildlife. At the moment, he seems to be the Secretary of State for protecting wildlife criminals. And that's not acceptable. Not acceptable at all. So what are we left with? Well, I'll tell you what we should be left with. We shouldn't be having an extension of this coal. We should be having a stop. We should have been a full public inquiry yeah. about how much money has been wasted, yeah. Yeah. about the criminal activity that's led to illegal yes. killing of these animals, yes. yeah. Yeah. about the dangers of perturbation risk. Because believe me, yeah. if those farmers have killed as many as I think they have, they will have spread this disease. Yeah. Because yeah. no controls at all. Those animals will have moved. You know if you use carbon monoxide, it will not disperse equally around this set. It will go through different exit points. Some of those animals will have brain damage. We know that. That's why it's illegal since 1982. And then they'll move. Those that are fortunate to survive. And if they die underground, they will have TB, they will have TB underground as well, so the disease can spread. That's why the NFU and government have always opposed illegal culling, officially. So what the hell are we doing allowing it to go on like this? Yeah. It's an absolute disgrace. Scandal. And it should not be happening. But let's take heart, okay? Because the one thing that's come out of this debate, which has fascinated me and made me feel so special about being able to work with you and others, is we've seen such commitment. We have seen such drive and energy. We've seen such care and compassion yep. from the best of British people around this country. All politics and not, all walks of life, all yeah. ethnic groups. Yeah. Coming together to say enough is enough. You don't play politics with our wildlife. You don't allow us to basically just kill animals like this and everyone will just stay quiet. We have a right about our country. I care about farmers. We need them. They produce our food. They are the backbone of our nation. I'd agree with David Cameron on that. But that yeah. does not give them a green light to kill wildlife. Yeah. We have yeah. a stake in that as well. Protected wildlife. And I want to talk about the retailers a moment. I've wrote an article that you can get a chance to see tomorrow in The Grocer, which is in response to our friend Justin King at Sainsbury's and the comments he made at the National Farmers Union Fringe at the Tory conference. When he was asked by the Farmers Guardian about what his opinion was on culling, and he said, well, I don't think we can have a welfare scheme for badgers in our store because isn't it welfare really to kill them? He's back to David Cameron again. Yeah. If it, they're sick, they must be killed. That doesn't make any sense to me. Now, Justin King, I've worked with in the past. He's a clever guy. Don't get me wrong. He knows business. He's turned that business around and he's done great wonders with it as a business. But he's wrong on this. OK, and what I've written in the grocery is important. It's easy for people like me to stand here and criticize everyone. What are the answers? Well, the retailers have a chance to deal with this problem. They have huge influence over the food supply chain. A few things they should do. They should establish a cattle and a badger welfare scheme, okay, for both species, which is basically aimed at reducing bovine TB. One quick way of doing it would be to start funding a national vaccination of badgers on all the farms in their food supply chain, working with the wildlife trust. Okay? And they could do that easily. Secondly, secondly, they should help farmers again to support them, putting in biosecurity fences and gates and securing those pens and feed areas to stop the interaction between badgers and cattle, which we know can spread the disease. Let's do it seriously and make it happen. Okay. And then the next thing is the cattle issue, because Owen Patterson keeps talking about the 10 years. He hates Europe. He's closer to UKIP than anyone. But it's very convenient of him now and again to hang up that European Commission 10-year programme before he'll get these cattle vaccines. The 10-year programme is in the UK government's hands, okay, and the retailers' hands. What would happen if we have a, a trial of these vaccines in this country over the next 12 months and we can and the Welsh Government want it and we can prove it can work and it will. It won't be 100% efficient but it will be 60-70%. Combined with badger vaccination and biosecurity that will be damn better than killing yeah. badgers than what we're doing at the moment. Yeah. 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 What the retailers could say to the government is we will seek a derogation from the European Union so all of those cattle that are vaccinated are only used in the UK supply market. Yeah. They're certified as UK only cattle not going to export. Okay, so the meat from those products goes into our stores, the dairy foods goes into our stores. And not only that, you then create a new premium product sector for good quality British produce in our stores. So rather than killing badgers for trying to get a cheap book to sell food to China, we'd actually re-establish a quality food supply system in this country that would take account of the interests of farmers and higher prices for what they need, but also for protecting our wildlife as well. That's got to be a good thing. It's not rocket science. So when Justin King got his inbox full of thousands of people complaining after he made that silly statement at the NFU conference, 
he should now realize that he's got quite a simple route to actually deal with the problem where his customers will come back and thank him for it, where we'd spend a little bit more in store, where the farm will get more back, and where we're really tackling this disease. That's a very positive way forward, and that's how we can deal with it. Yep. The political stakes are very high here. People often say to me, do people care about this issue? They I do don't. care. You're here, but there are thousands that can't be today that would be as well. On Twitter, on Facebook, there are millions of people out there. Over 300,000 have signed that petition, more than any other petition really? in this country. Yeah. Yeah. There are millions now voting at the National Trust, and I think they will overrule the National Trust Council yeah. to say they don't want vaccination on their land, particularly after this week's events. I would be surprised if that does not happen. And the numbers, the Tory party has 134,000 members, and it's lost 60% of those <laughs> since David Cameron's been leader. Okay? <laughs> The wildlife trusts in this country have 800,000 members alone. Yes, yes. The RSPB has 3 million members. Yep, the yes. National Trust over 4 million members. Are you telling me that people don't care about wildlife and the environment in this country and they're more concerned about being a member of the Conservative Party? I don't think so. Yeah. But I will blame Labour to a degree as well because I don't think yes. they've done enough on this. Yeah. I was pleased that Ed Miliband finally got off the fence and yeah. said that they don't want to back this cull. But they need to go further. If any culling is going on, they need to stop it. Yes. Stop. Yeah. Full stop. Yeah. Now, I know what politics I used to work as a young Labour organiser in the days of Tony Blair. And I'll just tell you a story about trying to win him over to some of this. He was on his 1996 world domination tour before he became Prime Minister. <laughs> and Tony was good, don't get me wrong, he was good. And people like Alistair Campbell around him, he would go and he'd speak to audiences and he would really have them eaten out of his hand. Those were the early days before Iraq, of course. And we took him to a school in Wimbledon. And I said to the team, listen, we've got to put him in front of some kids. He's got to reach out to kids. And Tony goes, yeah, we'll do that. Sounds great to me. He went in with his standard speech about he was going to deal with the economy and Europe and all these issues. And then we took questions from the kids. Every one of those questions was on the environment and wildlife. Yeah, yeah. They were saying, what are you going to do about fur farms? What are you going to do about animal testing? There was a question about badgers, believe it or not. There was a question about climate change in there too. And a question about global population increase. And obviously a number of questions about fox hunting. And what he found out that is the energy in that room was incredible. These young people really cared. Yeah. And that went back into the Labour Party machine and that manifesto that you saw develop working with animal welfare groups, which led to the closing down of fur farms, which led to significant steps that we've now seen to stop cosmetic testing on animals, that led to the final banning of fox hunting, even though we know the law is far from perfect on that, yeah. came about from that type of event where he had to listen to young people. And the funny thing is, one of the people in that audience, that was over 17, 16 years ago now, contacted me the other day. They're in their 30s now, they've got kids of their own, and they've been following the Badger debate. And they said they remembered that day. And now they were real wildlife ambassadors today. And they were influencing their children and the way they were thinking about issues like this. And that's what it means to me. You've got to reach out to people and you've got to listen to them as politicians. The wildlife issue is powerful and it's important and it can influence people's voting intentions. And yes, we might not be able to change everything about global population increase and climate change, but we should be able to change this issue in terms of how we control and protect our wildlife yeah. in our own areas where we live. I spend a lot of my time talking about elephants in Africa when I'm not talking about badgers. And this week I've had some controversy about saying we should be shooting poachers and they're shooting elephants. Yeah. Yeah. But we're losing ranges in Africa and we have no options but to take those sorts of tough decisions. But the other concern that I have is I can talk to ministers like Patterson and Benyon before he was sacked last week about Africa and you can have a very good conversation with them. They all want to help to save elephants and they damn well should because we're losing them at a fast rate. But you can't tell people in Africa that they should look after their animals and their welfare if we're destroying our own wildlife here. A key point in this campaign. We're going to extend these culls. Natural England is a rubber stamp exercise. I want to see a few changes going forward in government. I don't think you can have a natural England. I don't think you can have an environment agency that do not have real power over protecting wildlife. What I would like to see is all the MPs from parties who really care about wildlife beginning to think about having a proper wildlife protection agency in this country yes. that yeah. is independent of DEFRA, yeah. independent yeah. of all government yeah. departments, yeah. Yeah. and to be honest with you, is a complete pain in the arse yeah. when any politician wants to do something that might have a negative impact on wildlife. Yeah. That might be building a railway, it might be developing a new housing project, it might be trying to deal with an animal disease like bovine TB. And then it has a board of wildlife groups, conservationists and scientists who know what they're talking about, who will be listened to and respected, <laughs> and that will have influence in the public debate. What I'm sick of 
is that DEFRA says it cares for the environment when it's basically being largely run by the National Farmers yeah. Union yeah. and the Countryside yeah. Landowners yeah. Association. Yeah. When I got out of that in 1999, because of all the disaster of BSC, they broke it up and changed it into DEFRA because they said, listen, the influence of the NFU was too strong. That's why BSC happened. It was a crisis. We're back again, 15, 16 years, where we started. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The NFU's pulling all the levers again. Yeah. That is fundamentally wrong. Yeah. So a wildlife protection agency that's got teeth and is independent. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. A real strong voice in government for protecting wildlife that connects with all of us who care so much, who vote as well, so that we have a proper voice over this. And that the scientists are listened to incredibly are not pushed aside by politicians and that we think about Britain as a country. We're a caring, compassionate society. We do care about animals. That's why the RSPCA was created here. That's why organizations like the Vegan and Vegetarian Society started here. That's why Compassion in World Farming started here. That's why the WWF started here. There wasn't any great sort of, you know, experiment in the world why it started here. It's because people cared. Yep. And that's why in Horsham in the 1970s, you know, it's two charities from one shop. Virginia McKenna, Bill Jordan, Bill Travers came together to sell items to try and support farming and, and, and environment projects around the world. And that became Born Free and became Care for the Wild, who I work for today as well. Two charities doing great work in Africa and around the world. That's why Britain is special. That's why we care. And that's why people are down in those cool zones now in the cold and the wet. And yeah. basically making everyone, not just in this country, but around the world, think about how we care about wildlife. Yeah. And they are doing so much. From them. And they're saying, Dominic, keep doing what you're doing. All of you yeah. keep coming together because we watch yeah. these videos. We listen to you. And when we're going out in the rain and the cold, you make us think that no one's forgotten about us down here. Yeah. That you do yes. care. And that's yeah. why we do this. And that's why we'll keep on doing this. And we'll win this debate. We'll win it because of that negligence, because of that incompetence, and because of that deceit. And it's not just for badgers. It's for the future of our wildlife and what value we put on it and who will influence the decisions about the future of its protection, not just for our generation, but for generations to come. Thank you for coming. Thank you for giving your support. Thank you to everyone who's organised. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you all for turning up. Thank you. Thank you.